If I could ask everyone to please stand for a moment of silence in respect for the men, women, children in the photos that you see around here and in other photos that are not here. Thank you. I would like to, my name is Jim Hooper, and I would like to thank Skip Rutherford uh, for, for the invitation, and the school, for the invitation to come here. Uh, Nikolai, who's been taking such good care of us and who planned this, uh, this, this whole event, many, many thanks, Nikolai, and to the Clinton School, and if I may, I would like to give a, a shout out, if that's the right word, but I would like to draw attention to General Wesley Clark and his wife, former NATO commander, um, who was the architect of the victory, of the NATO's victory uh, in the Kosovo War in 1999, uh, and who has remained interested in international relations and has actually met in the past with uh, some of the uh, leaders of the Syrian opposition and has a real interest in uh, in the Syrian opposition and in some sort of future for democracy there. So General Clark and Mrs. Clark, thank you very much for coming. Um, I, 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 we have just, a, each of us are going to speak for just a few minutes and then we'll have a, more questions and answers as I understand. But uh, uh, my, I was a foreign service officer for 25 years. I served in the Middle East, including in the U.S. Embassy in Damascus. And that was during, during the time of not this president, uh, Assad, but his father when he was president of Syria. Uh, I had my own NGO dealing with the Balkans, actually, after that. Uh, I was head of the Washington uh, Office of the International Crisis Group. Uh, was the founding general manager of Radio Sawa, which was set up after September 11th to broadcast uh, to the Middle East, uh, and was the managing director of uh, Public International Law and Policy Group. Let me say something to you about Caesar, about the reason that we are gathered here, and who took the photographs that you see it's fine. Yeah. You guys can no, go. Yeah. Go no, okay. It's fine. Caesar was an ordinary Syrian who faced extraordinary challenges. And in responding to those challenges, which had never, he had never faced anything like that in his life, I think it's fair to say that he found capacities, values, and courage in himself that probably had never occurred to him, that he didn't think he had. Like many people, he didn't think he would have that kind of courage. He was a forensic photographer for the, for the uh, military police in Syria. And he would take pictures during, before the war began. He, it was his job to, to go to crime scenes uh, and, and take photographs, uh, a normal job. And he was dragooned into this work. Uh, and, and you might ask, as someone asked who, who we were talking with before the event began tonight, why did they document this? Why did the Syrian government document the torture of so many people, of its own people, by, by the government. And the reason is actually very simple and, and yet very grisly when you think about it. But from a bureaucratic point of view, the reason was that the various security agencies had quotas that they had to fulfill of people that they tortured, that they killed and tortured. And they had to prove to the leadership that they met these quotas. And the photographs, he was not the only photographer, there were others. The photographs were the evidence 
that they would use to demonstrate that they had, had met their quota and that they had actually tortured them, not just shot them, whatever, but actually tortured them. This, it, this, is, this was a almost unique type of, type of situation. And he experienced this in, in that he was the last step in the process, that is getting the photos of the dead bodies, the torture victims. And he rebelled against this, but he rebelled quietly and he re rebelled in a very thoughtful way. What he did was, uh, because photographs these days are digital, of course, he decided to smuggle his, the photographs and he smuggled out um, Waz or Ambassador Rapp can, can, can tell you. Um, over 25,000, I think, photographs of, of people, of dead, you know, tortured victims. And if you think about this, and this went on for several months, I think up to a year, but I, I, I uh, two and a half years, up to 55,000, up to, up to 55, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking back from an earlier time. And so when you think about it, he is taking these photographs for and, and smuggling them out for two and a half years. Now, it, from Syria and from Damascus, and these are all from a particular um, hospital mm -hmm. uh, where they were killed uh, in Damascus. For two and a half years, he lived with the fear that, that his smuggling network, I mean, his network would be uncovered and that he himself would be caught and treated like this. So it wasn't just that he had the courage and, and his family was there. So it wasn't just that, and he was an ordinary person. I really want to stress this. He wasn't someone uh, with a PhD or he hadn't, he hadn't thought through his, his uh, philosophy, his political science philosophy of life or anything like that. I mean, he was just a normal guy. And, and he reacted you know, this way, and he lived for two and a half years while smuggling this out under the fear that he would be uncovered. And every day lived under that fear. And, and you know, I, I, I don't have any illusions. I could never do that. I, w I wouldn't have the courage. But he, he had you know, this ordinary Syrian. He, he had the courage to do this. And the reason, the reason that he did it was not just to get this out, to document it so that the world would know. He wanted to get this out because he believed in the United States. He wanted this to come to the West and he wanted this to come to uh, these photographs to get to the United States and he wanted them to get to the President of the United States. And, and he did, ultimately Caesar did come to Washington, Moaz can tell you about his trip. But it's because he, he knew that there were 75,000 or more, a, a large number of others in prison awaiting their interrogation, torture, and execution. And he wanted to prevent them from being tortured and killed. He had a very, it was a very practical approach that he took. He actually had uh, a specific action that he wanted taken to prevent this. And he, and he believed in the United States. He believed that the United States stood for something and that if, if there was any country in the world that it was worth approaching with this that would do something to prevent further torture and killing, it was the United States. So he, he believed in us as a, as a country. He believed in what the United States stood for. So that was, that's a, a little bit about um, what, about the background. And I, I will just say that he is obviously no longer living inside Syria. He is living in a secret location outside of Syria. Uh, but uh, he still lives with some concern for he and his family because if uh, he were to be, uh, uncovered, um, so to speak, uh, he is he, his, he knows that his life is at risk. So you're dealing with the, this exhibition and these photos were taken by someone who risked his life, risked his family's life, and whose life continues to be at risk for what he did because he wanted this to stop. 
Now, if I can just, if there's one lesson that, that you can take away from this that I would ask you to think about tonight when you leave here, it is, it is this, just one takeaway from all of this. It's that justice needs power. Justice, that this is not going to be stopped by a United Nations vote. These kind of things won't stop by a world court decision. This kind of stuff, this doesn't stop unless an end is put to it. And so therefore, ju I really want to repeat that. And it's a phrase that I was first, that first came to my attention from a Syrian who'd been wounded and so forth, one of the political leaders in the opposition. And when we were talking once, he said, you know, justice needs power. And I think that's true. Justice needs power this, you know, in order for this, for these kind of atrocities to end. Uh, was? Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Skip uh, and Nikolai uh, um, and Natalie and everybody that worked on this uh, on on this amazing exhibit and in the Clinton School for for hosting us here because um, this is an incredibly powerful exhibition. It is something that everybody should see, as difficult as it is to see. Um, but this is this is the world that we live in, and this is something that is ongoing today. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, um, my name is Moaz Mustafa. Uh, I was born in Damascus, Syria, uh, and I moved to the United States uh, when I was about 11 years old. And I moved to Arkansas, uh, so this is my home state, and uh, I attended high school, actually, in, in Lakeside and in Hot Springs. Um, I went to the University of Central Arkansas, where I graduated. Um, and I moved to Washington um, as an intern for Congressman Vic Snyder, and Katie um, was one of the mentors that I had and people that sort of helped me learn the ropes when I first uh, got there. And I went on to work for Senator Blanche Lincoln. Um, and today um, I'm the executive director of uh, an American nonprofit organization that's based in Washington, D.C., called the Syrian Emergency Task Force um, that works uh, on legal issues, helping with war crimes documentations and witnesses, political advocacy in Washington, humanitarian aid uh, that we work with, amazing group of Arkansans here uh, called the Wisdom House Working Group, which you all should get to know. Um, and we also work with civil governance on the ground in Syria to try to make sure in areas that are no longer under regime control uh, that there is democracy there from the ground up, that they have local elections, that they're ruled by civilian governance, not by extremists or warlords. Uh, or anything else, um, and it's really, truly an honor to, to be here. Thank you. Would you like me to? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Well, so. Launch away. Um, yeah. So we had some preparation before. I'm sure. So just wanted to give you all, um, and I'm not sure sort of at how familiar everybody else is with Syria, but we hear a lot on the news about the refugees. We hear a lot about ISIS. Um, we hear about a horrible war in the Middle East, but many of us, I think, are used to hearing about wars in the Middle East. But Syria isn't a place um, that's used to war. For as long as I grew up there and the many summers that I visited, um, it was a beautiful, safe place, Damascus, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, a place where Christians, Jews, Muslims, Kurds, Arabs, all kinds of people live together. Um, for thousands of years um, and, and lived together in stability for a very long time until the beginning of this conflict um, where their entire life turned upside down. So when you think about Syria, don't think that these people are at all used to war. They're no different than you and I. Um, and they are, there was, we had a very high literacy rate, very educated. You could probably look at the Syrians here in, in America and see the doctors and lawyers and engineers and that's how it was there. Um, but to give you just a very quick uh, summary of, of what happened in Syria. Um, in April of, two, in March 15th of 2011, um, the Arab Spring had begun in different countries across the, the Middle East. In Tunisia, we saw protests against their own dictatorship. Uh, it was only a matter of a week before the dictator left, and you have a democratic country in Tunisia now. Um, the one good experiment that came out of the Arab Spring. You saw in Egypt the many protests and so on. And as these things were unfolding, people in Syria that were watching satellite channels and so on were watching what's happening elsewhere. And I can tell you, me personally, I never thought in a million years there would be any sort of uprising for Syria, any sort of protests. Because I remember when I'm in Syria, if we were even to joke about 
the president, um, we would joke quietly, whispering in our own homes. That's the level of security state and fear that people had. Um, and these pictures show you what they were afraid of. They knew what happens when you get arrested. This is even before the revolution. Um, but these children that had watched TV and saw protests, nonviolent, calling for democracy, calling for freedom, for dignity, um, they were between 9 and 13. They went out in a southern town in Syria called Dara and wrote on the walls, freedom, democracy, and so on. The response by the local authorities was to arrest these kids and it was to torture them, many of them to death. And when the families came to ask for accountability to what just happened to children that shouldn't even be liable if they actually did something wrong, and here they didn't, they were told to go home and make new ones. And so in that town began the revolution in Syria, which was nine months, and this is by the dictator's own admission, nine months of peaceful, nonviolent protests where bare chests were met with bullets and unlawful arrests into these torture chambers um, that they, where they would face their ultimate fate. And as, as that city went out in protest, and as the oppression of the regime happened, we saw other cities like Homs, where we have people from Homs here actually, um, which has been almost completely destroyed, came out trying to get the attention of the regime away from the other revolting cities, saying, come here, attack us. And this continued to the point where the military, which was deployed by the regime to go against these protesters, by the way, at the beginning, not even asking for the downfall of the regime, but asking for reforms, for rights, for democratic things that we enjoy here and we so often take for granted. And as that happened, many people in the army itself could not shoot at their own citizens, could not fire at their own civilians, as much as the regime tried to deploy different troops to cities that were not their localities to try to lower that risk. And that helped form, and unfortunately, because I really did believe, and I, I honestly believe that in terms of protest, we should, it should always be nonviolent, it should always be peaceful. Um, but many of these uh, soldiers in the army that couldn't shoot at their own people defected. And when they defect, they defect with their entire families because repercussions come across the board. And they began defending these protests. Now at that point, there is no Al-Qaeda, there is no ISIS in existence. Um, there is simply a people revolting for what the United States declares so often as the rights of everyone to what people believed that the Western world, that the United Nations would come to their aid knowing that their own dictator didn't even cater to Western society. This was someone that was supporting and arming terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. This was someone that was sending terrorists to kill our own servicemen and women in Iraq. And nevertheless, there was very little action done. And as time went on, things got worse. And so one thing that I always remember, and I try to remember to continue doing what we do here, is when I go back so often to Syria and Turkey, uh, and I talk to anyone that lost a father or a mother or a daughter or a sister, um, and to them, it, as complex as the situation is now, and I'm happy to answer later any questions about those complexities, but to them it was a very, and it remains a very simple thing. We went out asking for, at the very least, our dignity and freedom, and we are facing what we face today uh, because of that choice that we made. And I think that's really beautiful, and it re-energizes me, and it should re-energize everyone to understand that as, as clouded as it is, there remains at the heart, the core values of this revolution, uh, these people that are seeking what we have here today. Um, just, you know, from my own organization, and one thing to remember, you know, Syria has the Syrian people that are being fought against by the Assad regime. But it also has groups like ISIS, foreign to the country, fighting this opposition at the same time. Our own organization is sort of a micro example of that. We lost four young people, all under 25 years old. Um, two were taken by the regime and tortured to death in these prisons. And two others were taken by ISIS and beheaded. So it's always important to remember that this isn't just ISIS or Assad. We should never pick one evil over another. But this is a, a, a revolution that for so long tried to be peaceful, that was left alone, that continues to fight. And finally, these pictures that you see around aren't something that happened in past. And aren't even pictures, the almost 55,000 photos are only a snapshot, both in time and in geography of men, women, and children that are tortured to death only between 
April of 2011 and August of 2013, the time when we had, uh, where Caesar had to leave uh, the country for his own safety. Uh, and so this goes on every day, these, this machinery of death, these different pictures of these military hospitals is something that is ongoing. And these photos have been all around the world these very same photos that you see here were the United Nations General Secretariat. They were the United States Congress. They sit in a permanent exhibit at the U.S. Memorial Holocaust Museum, which provided us these banners, um, showing their support and in, in, in showing that it is important that we memorialize horrible things that happened in the past, but we take that memory and make it action, that this should not be okay. Um, and so, the EU Parliament, the United Nations, the United Kingdom Parliament, um, uh, the United States Congress, uh, and many other places. And finally, just to give you an idea of the scope of, of, of where we are now, 14 million people have become displaced as refugees or as internally displaced. Syrians are today the most displaced people in the entire world by the, the sort of the opinion of many experts, this is the worst humanitarian crisis that we have since World War II. Half a million, well over half a million, have been killed. Hundreds of thousands sit in these prisons facing the same very fate that you see here. These children or elderly, farmers, uh, women, these were not fighters. These were people that were just picked up randomly at checkpoints. Um, and, and taken. And Ambassador Rapp can, can, can give even more insight into, into this machinery of death and, and what goes on there. And so today we sit down here as the war in Syria continues. Chemical weapons were used on a large scale, on a scale where even when our own president had said that that would be a red line, we thought the entire world would act, and it didn't. Um, barrel bombs, these barrels full of explosives and and TNT and gasoline and shrapnel that are dropped on civilian areas, the targeting of hospitals, not the accidental collateral damage of hitting hospitals, but the targeting of hospitals and the targeting of schools that's done regularly as, as, as a strategy by the, by, by the regime and its allies, which are Iran, the IRGC, Hezbollah, and the Russians, because they need to break the will of the people. They need to break the will and, and the, of, of the people that engender these, these sort of, you know, dreams of, of freedom and democracy that they so very much deserve in, in their country. Um, and, you know, I often say this, um, but, you know, we, we, we go through at times in history, or we read about at least, you know, these never again moments, these horrible things that happened. And, and, and I like to tell myself at least, I know many others do that are just human beings that, you know, if we were there, if we can see the machetes that were coming into Rwanda, we would do something about it. We would stop that. If we knew about the Holocaust, we would bomb the train tracks to make sure these people aren't sent to their deaths. If we could do something about Srebrenica or any of the other horrendous never again moments in our history, we would do something about it. Well, today, there is, this is our never again moment. This is the worst humanitarian crisis. These are the most displaced people. And it has been times when they forever pleaded for our help, specifically the United States, because the UN was impotent to act due to the Russian veto. And they, 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 they asked for support, they still do. And then that evolved into a time when they started saying, well, why has the world deserted us completely? Why do they not care? And there was a brief moment when the little kid, Aylan, who was a refugee on the beach, uh, when people said refugee, people thought about this little kid um, that died running away to try to survive, not running away for lower taxes or better health care. These people ran away because they were forced. Nobody wants to leave their homes. They don't want to come to America. They don't want to go to Europe. And after only a few weeks of the sympathy of the world about Aylan, the word refugee became synonymous with terrorist. And so it came to a point where the Syrians stopped asking me, why do people not care about us? And they started asking me, well, why do they hate us so much? Why is it that this is okay, that this happens to us? And just on this file alone, one example of how little their blood is valued, at least in their own perception, and I agree, is that when we do find a victim, um, and we do find their family, and they say, look, this is my brother or sister, please get us justice. 
I have to ask a question that is, well, does your brother or sister have a dual nationality? Do they also happen to be Canadian or American or European? And when they say no, we essentially have to say, well, I'm sorry, we really can't do anything about it. And that's another example that is almost too real of how alone they feel in the world and how important it is to stand in solidarity with them. Um, and so I, I just want to say, you know, we've, you know, I think everybody should be outraged about what's happening today. But I think it's our obligation, more so because we're American citizens. We're not Denmark or something else. We're the United States. And we are one of the few countries that the entire world waits for us to act. And when the United Nations is impotent to act, it is our responsibility to protect. Um, but thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Moaz and, and Jim, for, for your eloquent remarks. And thanks to the, to the Clinton School of Public uh, Service for hosting this exhibit and this, and this panel uh, tonight. And, and thank you all for, for coming out on, on a Friday night for, for this, uh, to see these horrific photos and, and, to, uh, and, and to discuss uh, what's happened in Syria, what is happening as we speak uh, in Syria. Uh, my name's Stephen Rapp. I'm, I'm from the middle of the United States, like, like all of you. I was from Iowa. I was a federal prosecutor in Iowa in the 1990s, uh, working quite often with your U.S. attorneys here on cases against, uh, against uh, gangs, uh, methamphetamine rings, and others, uh, people that were threatening uh, uh, people in their homes and, and, and communities. In 2000, I made the move to the international level, I always thought if you want you when you're a prosecutor, you always want to get Mr. Big, uh, and and in Iowa they weren't that big, and I thought let's let's go to the international level, and we'll really get some some big bad guys, and and I went to the Rwanda uh, Tribunal, which was established by the United Nations in in East Africa, in Tanzania. I moved my young family there, and for six years I prosecuted the perpetrators of the Rwanda genocide of 1994. You can read about it in the, in the, in the museum ac uh, across the path here. Uh, 800,000 men, women, and children murdered in a period of 100 days, uh, incited by, by hate radio, and my first case involved prosecuting the people who incited that killing on, on hate radio, and later I became the chief of prosecution in charge of, of all of the trials that eventually have tried uh, 85 uh, individuals who were political, military, media, religious, believe it or not, uh, priests and, and, and uh, Anglican bishops and, and others and nuns that, uh, that incited the, the killing and, uh, and, and presented the evidence and, and convicted 85% uh, of them uh, in these international trials that were held in East Africa. I then was appointed by, by Secretary of, of um, Secretary General Kofi Annan to be the chief prosecutor at a special court that had been established in West Africa dealing with the horrors in Sierra Leone, which you may have read about uh, in, 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 uh, in, in books uh, about child soldiers or in, or in the movie Blood Diamond. Um, pr I prosecuted those responsible for mass mutilations and amputations and rapes and, 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 and murders of, of tens of thousands of people, including the former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor. And we moved that case to The Hague and tried him, and eventually he was convicted and sentenced to 50 years for 11, 11 counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes, a sentence that he's serving today and will serve until he's in his 90s. Um, because of that work, I was asked by President Obama to be his ambassador at large for war crimes issues, an office that under Secretary Clinton we eventually changed the name to Global Criminal Justice because it was hard to get into some countries if you said you're, you're here to talk about war crimes. But uh, I did get to a lot of countries, to 87 of them, and traveled, uh, I think, in six years to, on 1,250 days, one and a half million miles, uh, like around the world every six weeks. Uh, and, and of course, in a lot of situations, there, were, there, there was a possibility of justice. There was reality of justice. I see General Clark back here, and we worked so hard to bring uh, uh, General Mladic, the individual responsible for the mass murders 
I, mean, I can say that, I think. <laughs> but, but the trial, we're still waiting the verdict, finally. Uh, he was in hiding for 16 years, and it was a, a fantastic day uh, in 2011 when we finally uh, arrested him on the 26th of May, 2011, and using all of the pressures, all of the, all of the levers that, that we could, and his trial is now completed in The Hague, and, uh, and we'll soon have, have judgment in his case. In other places, it's, it's possible to, 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 to have a court, to, to work with local authorities, to establish an international court uh, through the, through the uh, UN Security Council, as we did with Yugoslavia, Rwanda, or Sierra Leone, or Cambodia, or uh, to, uh, to take cases to the ICC, even though we're not a member, it can be done through the, uh, through the UN Security Council. But that hasn't been possible in Syria, and, and it hasn't been possible in a lot of other places. So the focus of a lot of my efforts is, as, as I travel the world was always to, to meet with the victims, uh, to meet with those that were, that were doing the work to, to document uh, these crimes. Because frankly, I saw, I, I saw it when I was prosecuting uh, in the Midwest, uh, I saw it in the, in the Rwanda tribunal, I see it even sometimes in the Yugoslavia tribunal where uh, uh, cases against people that you know in your heart of hearts are really guilty and are responsible, you lose those cases because you can't tie the crimes uh, uh, done uh, in, the, in the village to the big leader uh, in, in, in the capital city who says, I have nothing, uh, nothing to, to do with this. And so uh, in these situations where we can't get justice right away, let's build the evidence. Let's build the strongest possible evidence. Then let's just keep pounding at the door. Let's find places where we can, we can start trials soon. Let's eventually uh, find opportunities where we can have justice in the future. We had one of these cases in, in Africa, a leader that had uh, tortured 40,000 of his people, 11,000 to death. Uh, we managed to establish a court in Senegal with African Union support that tried him now 25 years after the crime and he's been sentenced to life. His appeal hearing started, uh, uh, started the day before yesterday. So there, if, if you build the evidence, as we, as we say in Iowa, if you build the, the, the field, they'll come, you know. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's work at it, and let's, let, let's uh, do what we can. Uh, and that's certainly, uh, uh, in dealing with the, with the Syrian crimes and seeing the number of dead and, and the number of children and the innocent, uh, killed in, in massive numbers and, and tortured and, and, and families torn apart and, and, and millions of people leaving their home. And, and, you know, I, I, the whole refugee crisis, I think people see in, in such a wrong way because nobody wants to leave their home. <laughs> nobody wants to be torn away from their community and, and from the people they know and from the things they expect uh, in, in life. Uh, but you only do that when, when the dangers are so great that you can't survive there. And I saw that with the Caesar evidence. I remember when, when I was meeting with some of the families of, of the Caesar victims, when, when the pictures came out and some people were able to identify their children. They didn't know what had happened to them. People that were involved in businesses, like my father's business, that were that making deliveries for the shop. And, and they were picked up and somebody looked at their ID card and said, oh, you're from Dariah. Well, that, that's where you were born. That area has been controlled by the rebels. You must be a bad guy. And they're, they're thrown in prison and they're, and they're tortured to death. And, and later, they're part of these uh, 50,000 50, photos. Um, thanks to Moaz, uh, got to know Caesar three years ago, helped bring him to the United States, hosted him in, in, in my house in, in, in Washington. And this is the most remarkable trove of evidence that I have ever seen. I mean, some cases are hard. I mean, cases where, where there's bombing are hard, because obviously you can say, well, that bomb went astray. We were aiming for a military target. It killed civilians. That's not a crime. And indeed, sometimes in, in built-up areas, you're going to have deaths of civilians when you're doing everything right. But when you take people into prisons, and you starve them to death, and you gouge out their eyes, and you burn them with chemicals, and you cut open their bodies and remove organs while, without anesthetic, and you do that to tens of thousands of people. And then, with Caesar, what do we have? I mean, you can't see it on the pictures. We probably should really show the numbers that are on those cards, because they really don't tell very much. But, 
part of our, the delicacy here is we don't want to reveal any identities. But on each of those cards, you see some numbers. One of the numbers is the prison where they were killed, a number system that we know well. 215, about 40% of them come out of 215, which is a, which is a major center of, interrog of, of, of uh, interrogation by military intelligence. 235, the so-called Palestine branch. 248, where they, where, they, where they interrogate the most high value people. But frankly, a lot of the interrogation is, 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 is nonsense. They're not seeking information. They're committing sadistic acts. They're sort of making examples of, of, of people, sending a message of terror. Uh, to, to others, if you stand up for your rights, if you hope for democracy, if you were like those students and, and others in Dura in 2011, then this kind of thing uh, will, will, will happen to you. I mean, we, frankly, I mean, having dealt with evidence of, of, of massive and horrible crimes around the world, and having become familiar, because I now work at the end of my ambassadorship for the U.S. Holocaust Museum on, on accountability issues uh, sort of globally. Uh, this is some of the strongest evidence I've ever seen of a machinery of death and of the regime itself making, making the record of it. Now, when Assad was asked about this on BBC and others, he said, oh, it's Hollywood, you know, it's all, it's all made up. Well, it's not. I mean, when, when we obtained the uh, negotiated uh, with Caesar and the group around him and obtained this, this information. I delivered it to the FBI. Uh, they analyzed the metadata. If you know on photos, if you take a photo with your cell phone uh, and somebody analyzes the data, there'll be information. There may be GPS data. There may be date information. There will be information indicating the minute, the millisecond in which that picture was, was taken. Analysis of metadata can determine whether there's composite pictures. I mean, if you create a Photoshop, you got a picture taken on one day and a picture taken on another day, and they're put together. No, these pictures are images taken at exactly the same millisecond. They haven't been. They, they haven't been altered. Uh, and moreover, as, I, as, as I've indicated, they also evidence this whole pattern that Caesar is, has told us about, uh, which in, in which the regime, people say, what? is going on here. I mean, Caesar is a military photographer. He's part of military police before the, before the revolution. There's a repressive, nasty government. Uh, people that die, you go out and take pictures. Bring them back, somebody do something about it, somebody wouldn't do something about it. If guys flip over in a Jeep, you go take pictures of it. 2011, bodies start arriving at, at the military hospital. As you see in some of these images, in, in kind of the loading dock with 50 or 60 naked, emaciated uh, uh, bodies. And their job and their directions, their documents that are part of these photos, is uh, take these pictures, prepare files, send the files along. And so his team is doing that. And he's the guy who knows the computer. And each night, he's downloading from each of the digital cameras this information. Uh, then he begins to see people that he knows. The numbers just don't stop. He talks to ex members of, the, of his extended family and says, what can I do to get out? And they say, you know, you should stay in. You should record this. And they convince him to stay for months and years and to bring out on, on flash drives this, uh, this information and download it on an external hard drive and to do it over and over again until finally he begins to fear that he might have been found out. And, and it's necessary to fake his death and, and, and get, him, get him out of the country. But this is a tremendous record of, of evidence. And under the international law that I used, these are facilities that are within the state security services. The people on top of those institutions, leading to the pinnacle of, of Bashar Assad, are responsible for these crimes. They've now been told a thousand different ways about these crimes, and they're continuing them. They're failing to do anything to prevent or punish. So under international law, under the laws that, that we recognize, they're responsible for these crimes. What can we do about it at the moment? Uh, I mean, one of the key things was to try to identify as many of these victims as we could. And we tried to do that by photo matching. That's a complex thing to do, to compare pictures of people that are happy and alive and, and pictures of people that have had their eyes gouged out. 
uh, we were able to identify at least 775 of, of, of the victims, work with their families. We now can begin to work on, on some cases. We don't have an international court, but you can have national courts. Well, how can you have national courts? Well, if the torturers turn up in another country, you can prosecute them. We've done that in the United States. We've done that in other countries. We've done it with, in a dozen countries with perpetrators of the Rwanda genocide. You can prosecute somebody who's in your country who's committed crimes elsewhere. You can try to extradite them and send them someplace else, but you're not going to get them prosecuted in Syria. So you do it, uh, you do it in, in your own system. The other thing you can do is if individuals, and this is part of the frustration of dealing with Syrians, but if individuals in this group are um, foreign nationals or dual nationals or have a sister or brother who's already a citizen of another country, there can be criminal jurisdiction in that country for all of the persons responsible for the crimes. In the same way that if, uh, if an American is taken uh, hostage or kidnapped in South America and by, the, by some, some drug gang and you get a hold of one of the drug gang members in the United States, you can try him here uh, for the crime against the, the American citizen uh, uh, committed abroad. We're moving on some cases. I think within the next month we'll have, uh, uh, you know, and July. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a case on file. Obviously, we want to protect people. You don't want to risk family members or others. Uh, and so we're, we're working very hard on that question. It's, 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 it's challenging uh, to, to, to sort of wind, <laughs> wind through the eye of a needle to, to fulfill all of the sort of jurisdictional requirements that you need. And of course, we also know that if you, if you charge Assad tomorrow, which I'd love to do, uh, that doesn't mean he's in custody tomorrow, but, you know, he's on a wanted poster. I mean, Mladic was on a wanted poster for 16 years, and, ev and, and eventually he's in a jail cell in The Hague, and he's going to face trial, and, and has faced trial, and is now facing judgment. So if you, if you can begin to send the signal that you can't get away with this, and, and it's not just the torture. I mean, uh, uh, Moaz talked about the barrel bombs. You talk about the chemical weapons, you talk about the sort of things that were done in Aleppo, when the laws that we've been involved in in 150 years with the International Commission of the Committee, uh, Committees of the Red Cross to prohibit the attacks on doctors and medical facilities to make these absolutely solid and sacrosanct rules of international law just completely thrown out the window. Sending a signal to people that this is, this is the way you fight. We know it's no way to fight. I mean, when they gain Aleppo, they lose Palmyra. They're, this is not the kind of group, the Assad regime, that's giving us any strong a tool to use against the extremists. It makes more extremists. Indeed, the people that I see that, I've, that have actually come out of the prison say that he would often uh, pardon the jihadists to go out and fight. Uh, so it's not, uh, uh, this is not someone that we should, we should make common cause with. Uh, what we need to do is to, to build for justice and, and to hold people accountable, including those at the highest level. And it's something on which the United States uh, uh, for, for 60 years has been a leader under, under both administrations. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to get administrations of, of, of both political parties. I hope that we're now finally moving to the point where we may have justice uh, for these, these horrendous crimes. It's uh, not a reflection of the evidence, because the evidence is as strong as, as it can be. It's the absence of a court <laughs> with jurisdiction, uh, unlike we had in Rwanda or Yugoslavia or other places that give us the, the frustration. But we're going to find a way, and there's going to be justice for these victims. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for those remarks. Uh, we are getting close to our hour, so I wanted to make sure that we get some questions from you. And so if you've got a question, raise your hand as we're getting the mics out into the audience. I wanted uh, you each, in under a minute, to uh, say one change, whether it be policy at the international court level or U.S. policy towards Syria, um, that you would each make that would, that would either have prevented this or will help bring this to an end. Establish protected zones, which would be self-governing areas 
inside, inside Syria, which would be defended by international forces as well as by the Free Syrian Army, uh, including through a no-fly zone, which would enable people to, so it would stop the attacks and it would enable people to return to their, to begin returning to their homes. You could actually begin some reconstruction, but to give, and for them to govern those areas and to show what representative government can actually do. Um, exactly that. <laughs> Establish protected zones in the country. If it's not for the sake of humanitarian protection of civilians that r live under the rain of bombs every single day, um, it also matches our own national security interests. It also helps protect the European Union and NATO, which you see the rise of right-wing parties, you see you know, Brexit, other things. These were all symptoms, whether we like to recognize it or not, of the conflict in Syria. And so, you know, five million refugees out, you still have 10 million about internally displaced inside the country with nowhere to go and they want to stay. Protecting them and allowing them to have civil governance, allowing them to show the world an example of what Syria is without the Assad regime would not only counter the propaganda of ISIS and, and, and make uh, a place for the launch off of attacks against terrorist organizations like ISIS, it would also impose, because the regime cannot survive without the tactics it's doing, but it also would impose a political solution. It would bring this regime, which believes it has the ability to win militarily because it has a Russian air force, it has Hezbollah and Iran, etc., and a conventional army against, as President Obama once said, farmers and lawyers and pharmacists that are defending their people. Our revolution was farmers and lawyers and pharmacists that were defending their people. And that doesn't mean they're not equipped. It means that they deserve our support. So protecting th these zones from aerial bombardment, the number one reason for, for the death of Syrian civilians and the number one, re number one reasons for these massive flows of refugees, which will continue, both fits not only our moral values, but also aligns with our national security concerns. And, 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 and if you want something a little bit more specific, <laughs> there is a Caesar bill named after Caesar in the United States Congress, which passed the House last Congress. We now have to go back through the House and the Senate. Uh, but this bill sanctions and names out the heads of the intelligence branches that did this killing, at least call them out if we can't get a court today on that. It also calls for a complete study of a protected zone. That does not mean American troops deployed anywhere. It does not mean putting our young men's lives at risk. It simply means ending the refugee flow and allowing the Syrian people to have a better chance at fighting terrorism, which they could defeat and they have proved it. And it also allows the Assad regime to be forced to sit down and negotiate a transition to a democratic government. And, and let me not go on too long, because I agree with the others. Uh, keeping in mind my job and the administration dealt with the justice piece and not with military interventions, no-fly zones. But, but I always saw that the idea of establishing a safe area, and there's a the potential for it now uh, in, in the areas uh, south of Killis uh, uh, and, and elsewhere, uh, could allow us to begin to build for justice processes. Uh, I don't want to really see cases tried in Europe or America or anywhere else. They should be tried in Syria. Syrians should be involved in that. And when you begin to establish opposition control areas, then you can work with those individuals with international partners to establish fair, fair, fair justice. Uh, uh, and so I've always dreamed that that would allow us to get past this issue of trying to prove that somebody had a foreign tie before we could deliver justice, but I, I, I think that's essential. Uh, there's the idea of the sanctions and the Caesar's bill, Caesar bill is, is very good. Uh, we've, we, uh, the United States, the European Union, to a point of sanction. We haven't been able to get UN sanctions at all. We get them for a lot of other places, but on this one, the Russians will veto anything. But, but, but really looking at those that are enabling this regime in a variety of ways, including foreign actors and companies and others, uh, we need to go after them in a, in, in a, in a more serious way. And the Caesar bill uh, would, would, would allow it. It's not the same as justice, but it, it certainly sends the signal that, uh, that we're not going to trade away justice uh, for a, for a short-term political solution that, in fact, will make us more enemies in the long run than it gains us friends. All right. Any questions from the audience?
Jim. Um, well, first of all, thanks for coming here and presenting this. Very important that Americans see this and have an appreciation for what's happening. And um, I want to ask whether um, there's any um, ethnic or sectarian composition to these uh, crimes. Are they all against Sunnis? Are there Christians? Are there Alawites? Are there Shia uh, sects in this? Or is this simply against a particular sect in Syria? That's a great question. And I want to say, you know, at one point, one of the frustrations is a lot of people don't, uh, well, it doesn't count as genocide if you're killing everybody. Right? But if you're killing one specific ethnic group, then it's genocide. But he's killing everyone, so it's not genocide. It's all okay. And if you look at, at the photos, um, we have, uh, let me start out with Alawites. Alawites that have his father's picture tattooed on their bodies that have sometimes his own picture tattooed on his bodies, that have been loyal to him. In whatever tiny bit of disloyalty that was shown, the torture that was inflicted on them was as much, if not even more severe, than it's inflicted on Sunnis, for example. And um, based on the bodies and, and the tattoos and things, if you look and all of the bodies um, were sort of completely nude, you can tell as well the Christians that were tortured to death, and there were many of them. Um, the vast majority of those tortured to death are Sunnis, but that's also a matter of the demographics of the country. Uh, and, and, but, but this was um, across the board, um, and, and it's really sort of astounding um, that, that there's so little sort of outrage in general over what's happening. But it is Alawites, it is Kurds, it is Sunnis, it is Shiites, it is children and men and women and elderly. Um, that, that were tortured. And by the way, the one, one interesting thing, you remember those kids from Dara? That, that did this, at, when Caesar ran off right before he went, he went to his boss's desk and pulled off of the file um, as many pictures as he can get even outside of just Damascus that are not in, in the tranche of pictures that, that we discuss. Uh, and in those pictures included the pictures of those kids for the first time. And so there was proof of what was done to them as well, the spark of this revolution. And just let me say, uh, it, it, well, as I said, we, we don't have a genocide uh, here, but we have serious international crimes. Uh, and uh, of course, we have war crimes in, in a war, even when you're facing an insurgency, even when you face a terrorist organization, you don't intentionally target innocent people. You don't target doctors and medical facilities. You don't take people to prison and torture them to death by the, by the, by the thousands. So these are, I mean, they may be motivated by the fact that they think they're gaining something by doing it. So it is a war crime. It, it's associated with the war, but these are, these are massive crimes that could be prosecuted in an international or national court. There are also crimes against humanity, and, and in some situations, I've dealt with the Cambodia situation. Two million people were killed there. It's not really genocide, because they were killing Cam Cambodians, killing Cambodians. It was on a political basis, to a large extent. There's some Muslim and, and, and Vietnamese that may have gotten the worst of it, possibility of small genocides. But the major crime is, is a crime against humanity, which is, a, which is an orchestrated, widespread, and systematic attack against the civilian population. And one of the most serious crimes against humanity is persecution when you persecute people on an ethnic and a racial basis, but also on a political basis, because you think you've gained some political advantage by it. And, uh, and sometimes those are the worst crimes uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, so these are horrific crimes that could be prosecuted in any of the international courts that we've established, including Nuremberg, and can be prosecuted in national courts as well if we get a hold of the perpetrators. In the back, in the blue. One second. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. There's, there's a microphone coming to you. <laughs> what, reason, what reason does Hassad or Putin have for going along with this idea about creating a safe zone? Why would they do that? They would only do it if you used some element of power or threatened to use it in order to leverage your ability to persuade them through diplomacy. Otherwise, they're not going to. They haven't, they haven't agreed, they have, the diplomacy's been going on, negotiations have been going on 
for the past couple of years in Geneva, and it hasn't worked because the United States uh, and Europe and the Allies have not put any leverage into the process. What they look at is the leverage, and then they decide how they're going to deal with the, the diplomacy. If they, if they respect the leverage that you bring to bear on the issue, then you may get something from it. Uh, so this, this would be something that it would have to be probably imposed on, uh, uh, on the Syrian government uh, and Russia. That is, the United States and the Allies would have to do this, uh, and the, the international community would have to do this, uh, not, waiting for, not, not waiting for green light. You can, you can ask them, sure, but you don't give them the, ve the right of veto. Uh, you then move ahead on it. Uh, if, if, I, if I may, um, I don't mean to put someone on the spot here. Well, I guess I do. Um, but I don't mean to embarrass the person I'm going to put on the spot, General Clark. Um, you've had a lot of experience with these kinds of things. And it may be that you haven't been thinking about, specifically about some of these things about Syria lately, I, I don't know. But you've certainly dealt with, uh, in your time as NATO commander and your previous jobs, situations where, uh, where diplomacy uh, was facilitated by the, the use or the threat of force. And in, in fact, the, the NATO war that you led, uh, which ultimately led to uh, over Kosovo against, against Serbia, ultimately uh, led to a negotiated agreement under President President Clinton. Uh, but that was and Russia agreed. Russia ultimately agreed to a deal that was satisfactory. It wasn't maybe the best deal that we could have gotten, but it was a reasonably good uh, deal, and it certainly ended the ethnic cleansing in the Balkans. But if I, with that long introduction, if I might ask you. Do you have any, if you don't mind, do you have any observations about how one might move forward with protected zones, safe zones, in this kind of environment, given the realities of Syria and Russia and Iran? Well, since you asked me, uh, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard not to answer. So, um, you know, I first met the Syrian opposition in 2013. And um, it was clear at that time that um, the United States didn't understand how to deal in the region. You cannot, this is a region that um, unlike domestic politics, it only understands power. You cannot get negotiations without power. That power often is the use of force. So uh, if you had gone back in time, what you would have done is you would have declared a safe zone you would have found in the Syrian opposition someone like a Charles de Gaulle. You would have started with three or four of them. You'd have put them through ranger school. You'd have found someone who had the courage and the instincts and the skills to bring a consensus and have a strong leadership. You'd have had a safe zone, a no-fly zone, and yes, um, we might have uh, lost an aircraft or two over Syria, but you wouldn't have lost more than three or four. And you'd have recovered the pilots, and you'd have smashed that air defense system. And people would then be clamoring for U.S. weapons instead of trying to buy Russian weapons today. And if you had done that, you'd have had an alternative to this horror up here. And you'd have had a way of holding it accountable. So now the question is, what can be done? Well, I think where you are right now is you're in the process of, of wheedling uh, and, uh, and, and currying favor with Vladimir Putin because uh, he's in there and he's got air defense. And it's not Syrian air defense, it's real air defense. So if you go in there, it's a real military operation if you go against him. Um, but it's become excessively complicated. So what you had was when Bashar Assad fell, and, and Musa and Jim and Steve, if you don't agree, then speak up. But I'll just talk for a minute here from, and share for the people who are here if you're interested. 
I mean, the way I see it is, what you had is you had <clears throat> opportunity knocking. Syria has never been a real country. It was an artificial construct. And everybody wanted pieces of it. And everybody was afraid. And there were opportunists in the region. And one of the biggest opportunists was a man named Erdogan, who at the time was the president of Turkey. And he was prescribing a, or, or prime minister of Turkey actually in 2011, and he was prescribing a, an ethical foreign policy, which was the reconstruction of the Ottoman Empire across North Africa. And maybe even back to the holy cities. And um, you can't make a move in the Middle East without everyone understanding it who lives in the region. We don't understand it in America. They feel it in their bones and they could feel the Ottoman reach back in. So people in the Gulf responded. They also armed people. But then the super weapon came along. It was ISIS. And so ISIS was used by people in the region as a way of getting rid of the Iranian influence and opening up space so that they could then undercut ISIS and take what they wanted out of Syria. That's the way I read it. I know secondhand some of the people that ISIS got permission from before they attacked Mosul. But when you invite cancer into your body, you can't always control it. And ISIS then has a backbite in Turkey. And Turkey doesn't, Erdogan doesn't like that. But unfortunately, he knows them all too well. And it's not only Erdogan, it's others in the region who dealt with ISIS leaders. So now you have the Russians in, you have the United States administration saying the most, this is off the record, saying the most important thing is to get rid of ISIS. But if you get rid of ISIS and you cut a deal with this, then where are we left? What are we left with? We're left with having to live with this, to, to sanctify it, to welcome him back in the halls of diplomacy? God, I hope not. So this is a major issue. How do you deal with it? I think you deal with it in stages. I think the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get this administration in office and they've got to see these pictures and recognize that it's like a two-step. First, maybe you get rid of ISIS, but you don't rest with getting rid of ISIS. You got to fix this underlying awful situation in Syria and bring justice. You can't have peace without justice. You can't have justice without accountability. So that's the start. But it won't happen automatically. Syria's a long way away. I, I know some of you may even have relatives there. But for most of the people right here, even most of the people in this room, you don't know anybody in Syria. You don't have a business connection with it. it it's just a spot on a map. It looks like a little thing on a map. You don't even, you don't know the people, the villages, the education, the secular leadership of Syria. You don't know it. People closer to it and those in America who do know it must speak out. You must not allow this crime to go unpunished. I think that's a good, a good in, in point as any. Um, yes. Jim. Jim Waz, Ambassador uh, General Clark, thank you all so much for, for this and thank all of you for coming out and, and being engaged and, and staying engaged. If you haven't had a chance to walk around the room and, 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 and look at these, please do um, spread the word. And Waz, you have one thing that he wants to say. Um, so thank you again from the Clinton School. Mwaz. Sorry to add, I know you guys have been here for a while, but I want you to, you know, General Clark made a really good point. Most people don't know who the Syrian people are. They don't have relatives there or business there, don't understand. I often used to think too, like, you know, I wish I took as many people as possible to visit Syria before this whole war, because maybe people would have cared more then. But there are people in this room, in Arkansas, 
that are getting to know on a daily basis the people inside Syria, under the bombs, under besiegement, deal with them, talk to them every day. They include an amazing group of people, Terry and her husband and Madeline that are right here. It includes Brett, who is back there, who, by the way, has awesome brochures, and I don't know if this is even legal, but um, <laughs> on, on an amazing project. They, in Arkansas, um, have adopted, built, and supported and sustained a school for orphans inside Syria. Students here in different schools send videos and pictures to students there and they send them back. Um, English teachers here speak to English teachers there uh, and they connect on a personal level. So first of all, you're helping the internally displaced, way worse off than even the refugees outside the country. Um, second of all, you are getting to, to know who they are, and they have regular problems like we do here, but then they have other problems like not knowing if their school will be bombed tomorrow. So please have a chance to talk to Brett back there, and to Terry, and to Jerry, and to Natalie, and these amazing Arkansans that I, I, th I don't even know of any other place in America that does, um, and this gentleman right here probably that does, Kevin, that does this amazing work. Um, so if you're interested in how you get to know the Syrian people more and how you could work, work at least solely on a humanitarian level, please get a chance to talk to them and see them because first you help these kids, but then you're much more aware of what's happening and, and you could, uh, then, then you could advocate beyond that on a personal level, whatever it is that you believe is the right thing to do. But thanks again, Nikolai, and thank you all so much for, for your time.